Good afternoon and welcome to the Manhattan Resources Efficiency PLC Investor Update presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged, can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Ben Goldsmith, CEO, and Luciano Swana, CIO. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Paul, and um, thanks to everyone for dialing into this. Um, we've been delighted to see how many people have chosen to spend the next hour with us. Um, I thought it might be worth um, just describing a little bit of the background for those on the webinar who don't know us. Um, I, I was a founder at the very start of my career um, of WHEB, Web Asset Management. Um, I spent uh, nearly eight years building web. Um, web has a focus on what you might describe as the green industrial revolution. Um, it's a sustainability themed investment manager um, which invests only in listed equities and which today has um, approaching 2 billion of assets under management, um, really long only, uh, quite well diversified with a deep research into kind of environmental, social and governance considerations. But thematically, Web has been focused on the same themes as us at Manhattan. And I stepped back from Web in 2014, although I remain a friend and shareholder in that firm, because I wanted to set up a vehicle that would emulate the best characteristics of some of the longer term investment managers that exist in the London financial scene, the likes of RIT uh, Capital PLC, whose former chief executive Graham Thomas is chairman of our investment committee, or Caledonia or Hansa Trust or um, um, British Imperial and some of these vehicles that have been around for a long, long time and which in many cases have produced outstanding returns um, during decades. Um, or, or, or my own family's investment group, which was established by my late father, Sir James Goldsmith, who died when I was 15 in 1997. Um, that vehicle has compounded in excess of 8% for 20, nearly 25 years. Um, and I think the, the way it's done that and the way a lot of those investment trusts have done well has been by um, shifting their asset class according to how they feel in a particular period. Um, they, they haven't been tied to a particular asset matrix. Um, they haven't been tied to a particular time horizon. Um, private equity funds typically operate through a 10-year limited vehicle or, or longer or less. Um, the open-ended funds have the sword of Damocles hanging above them that investors will withdraw their funds the very next day. And all of that, I think, hinders can hinder good investment decision making. So what I wanted to create was a closed-ended vehicle that would have the ability to invest with, with a long-term perspective, but also the ability to get involved in esoteric, sometimes off-market, private transactions, private equity, private credit, the kinds of deals that often aren't available to, to regular investors, and which would have an asset mix that we could flex over time according to, according to how we see the world. Um, and that's why I went to speak to Graham Thomas at RIT, and, and, and ultimately Graham you know, still with us as a, as a chairman of our investment committee. And we launched with an IPO, um, 80 million pounds in July, 2015, um, with the idea that we would focus on energy and resource efficiency. So to be clear, we're not an ethical fund. Uh, we're not even an ESG fund. We're a fund which focuses on the theme which I think lies at the very heart of this green industrial transition. And that is the more efficient use of energy and other resources and moves towards um, a, a more circular use of resources in, in terms of business models. So we, we describe that in our prospectus as follows. We will invest in companies which either deliver or materially benefit from the more efficient use of resources. Um, we didn't have the best start. Some of you might have been with us since the beginning, but we had a bit of a mishmash in the portfolio at the start. We had some venture positions that didn't work out. Um, we got involved in um, uh, uh, credit of Abingar, a big, big solar business that went wrong. And Luciano, who you see on your screen, joined us about nine months in. Um, and we had a long think about how we would approach this theme. And we settled on um, the idea that we would invest um, along the Buffett School line of thought. So we would invest in businesses which are of high quality. So companies with strong balance sheets, with cash flows that we can um, understand and predict with some degree of comfort companies with strong competitive positioning, high entry barriers, 
Um, and we decided that we would um, pursue a value approach. So we like to invest in businesses where we feel we're getting in at a good valuation. Um, and that overlaid on the theme of, of energy and resource efficiency has worked really well. So since the, the reconfiguration of our investment approach, the arrival of Luciano as chief investment officer and, and, and the building of our team thereafter, the machine we've created is working. Uh, we've compounded at in excess of 15% annualized for coming up six years now. And in fact, our net return since inception, including the losses sustained in the first nine months, is not far off 9% annualized. So, so we've created something that works. Um, and um, uh, we'll, we'll talk you through what that is. Um, just in terms of the core team, so I'm chief executive. Um, I, I um, run the business and spend a chunk of my time looking at um, private equity and private credit opportunities, developing relationships with the best investors in, in the market who can show us what they're up to. Um, I began a private client brokerage, Hargreave Hale, and then spent a number of years building web, as previously mentioned. Luciano, in fact, Luciano, perhaps you'd like to give your background. Yeah, um, I started in uh, M&A, uh, working for Kleinwood Benson. Um, then um, internally, I moved to um, an area called the Liquids within Dresna, which was focused mainly in um, illiquid transactions in different sectors, real estate, uh, utilities, infrastructure, 70% um, of uh, which were credit, 30% equity. Um, after that, I moved to Barclays, uh, where I managed their uh, Brazil structure credit and Brazil uh, uh, credit business. And also looking into uh, structure credit business for Latin America. And in 2015, I moved back to the UK and I joined Manhattan in the beginning of 2016. And so Gra Graham is our chairman um, who spends half a day a week with us. Graham is a long-term investment banker, Goldman Sachs, and more recently prop, prop desk investor with a particular focus on infrastructure and real estate, who then went to become chairman of the executive committee at RIT and now runs a private equity business backed by Deutsche Bank and Goldman's called Stage Capital. And Teddy Bybus is our analyst and has um, um, a career in 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 buy side analysis in public equity markets. So that that's that's the core team. And between us, we own around quarter of the investment trust. So there's strong alignment here in terms of our interests and the interests of other shareholders. This is where a, a good chunk of our own money sits, and we invest the money as we would invest our own. Um, so there is there is a strong alignment there. Um, and our ambitions are long term. I mean, it's worth mentioning that, that both Luciano and I, who represent the, the kind of executive core team, we want to run this for a long time. We want to be here for decades, not years. We want to grow this vehicle along a similar trajectory that has been followed by RIT and Caledonia and some of the other um, long term London investment trusts. We're, we're, we're not in a hurry. Um, the board of the PLC is independent and is chaired by Sir Ian Cheshire. And the reason why we asked Ian to chair this is because Ian was one of the first FTSE 100 chief executives to embrace this idea that green means cost savings. It was Ian at Kingfisher, where he was chief executive, who announced a far reaching and extremely um, ambitious program of energy and resource efficiency throughout that business. The Kingfisher owns B&Q and Castorama and so on. Um, everything from fuel efficient trucks to LED lighting in stores. And I think a lot of shareholders and, and analysts really pilloried him for the amount of money he wanted to allocate to this. And within a few short years, that program was yielding a fantastic return on investment. And Ian, of course, has now been grandly vindicated. Um, Ian, I should mention um, Lord Rose, Stuart Rose, who did the same at Marks and Spencer under the moniker Plan A in brackets because there is no Plan B, um, suffered similar um, um, derision for an enormous CapEx program around green tech. Um, which paid for itself within four or five years and continues to be a mainstay of Marks and Spencer's business. So we wanted someone who understood the, in, the, 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 the industrial um, e efficiency story. And so Ian became our chair. Uh, Duncan is a long-term investment trust guy. M many of you on this call will know who Duncan is. He's on the board of a number of investment trusts and has had a long association with RIT. Emma Howard Boyd is a former um, investment manager at Jupiter, senior figure in Jupiter, who now chairs the Environment Agency, um, and Howard Pierce ran 
the hugely successful Environment Agency Pension Fund for a long time and, and gets this idea of investing with environmental efficiency in mind. So that's been the board since the IPO. Um, we're starting to come to the point now where um, some revolution will take place in that board as we add new members and the first board members come to the end of their term. Um, so the, 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 um, the, the idea was always to run a concentrated portfolio. That's one of the advantages of having a closed-ended vehicle is that you can avoid the need to have excessive diversification. Um, we, we always said from the start, we'll hold 15 to 25 positions. So a, a portfolio in which each position really matters and, and in which uh, we might have genuine understanding and uh, genuine um, um, sense of knowledge around each of our positions. We, we didn't see how with a small team we could effectively oversee 60 or 70 positions. So in a way, we invest more like a family office than, than, than the other funds operating in the area that we focus on. Um, this is a bit like a family office. Um, and the highest conviction ideas um, comprise significantly more than 10% of NAV. You'll, we'll talk about those in a moment. And a long-term approach, so at least five years in mind whenever we look at any position, publicly traded or private. So uh, aside from the big turnover in the portfolio following the arrival of Luciano and the rethinking of our strategy, turnover is low within the portfolio. We, we don't do very much. Um, and we're focused on capital preservation. One of the first things Luciano said to me as a former credit investor when he joined was I'm more interested in the return of my capital than the return on my capital. And um, I think that was a reassuring thing for the board to hear as well. Um, and that's been working. Um, so um, yeah, in terms of the theme itself, I'm, I'm, um, yes, in terms of the theme itself, I, I don't know how much we particularly want to dwell on this. So you, you open any newspaper now and and, and, and the story is right in front of you around some of the changes that are taking place in the world. And some of that remains subject to debate, but a lot of the debate is out of date very quickly. I mean, two thirds of the world's population now lives in a world, in a place in which solar is demonstrably the cheapest source of power. And if, 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 if that fact had been stated 10 years ago, people would have thought you were living in some kind of cloud cuckoo land. But solar is, is absolutely the cheapest source of power that humanity has ever developed. Uh, wind is in a similar place in parts of the Northern Hemisphere, certainly in the UK. Um, electrification of transport is moving along a pace. Um, we walk down any street in London now, and one in six, one in seven vehicles are electric. And, and it's hard to find any company which is not absolutely focused on the, the efficient use of every last ounce of, of materials or energy that it's consuming. Um, and, and, and circular business models are now becoming absolutely mainstream. Um, an example that I like in particular is the example of Philips, which is responsible for lighting the German motorway system. And until not so long ago, Philips was contracted by the German state to supply light bulbs and hardware. So there was no incentive whatsoever for Philips to deliver light bulbs that last very long or which use power um, very efficiently or, or hardware that, that has any a particular um, kind of robustness. Um, and then the German state flipped the deal and said to Philips, actually, we want you to supply us with lumens and we will charge, we will pay by the kilometer that you keep lit. And suddenly the incentive is on Philips to produce light bulbs that use power with the maximum efficiency, um, which lasts as long as possible and hardware that requires the least maintenance possible. And the changes have been absolutely dramatic. So this kind of circular business model um, in which uh, customers lease equipment and so on um, is, um, is, is taking off across the board. And we are interested in companies which are at the center of that. And those are often very large companies that we've all heard of. Um, but when you delve into some of the things that Microsoft, Google, and Charter are doing in, in, in moving us to a world in which resources are used efficiently, um, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And they're most certainly leaders in the field. Um, so that, that's how we think about um, uh, any business that we're assessing. Does it fit the theme? Um, is, is this business materially part of that transition that's taking place in the world? And when we talk about the portfolio in a moment, we'll explain the rationale behind some of the positions that we hold. Um, does the company have a strong balance sheet? Is this company going to survive in the medium term? Does this company have cash flows that we can understand and which are predictable with some degree of comfort? Um, does the company have a you know, competitive moat? Does it, are the entry barriers real and persistent? Um, sort of Buffett school approach. And are we getting value? 
and that 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 really is is um you know, we don't we don't deviate from this Venn diagram in in the way we assess both publicly traded and private positions. Um, and um, in, in terms of how we look at publicly traded versus private, uh, we're not a private equity fund. We don't have deep resource. We're not able to lead deals and get deep involved in the complexity of private equity, private credit transactions. So for the time being, and for the foreseeable future, we like to co-invest. And so we have a great co-investing relationship with the likes of KKR's infrastructure team, which we consider to be probably the best infrastructure private equity team in Europe. We've co-invested with Apollo. We've co-invested with a group in Brazil called Perfin in, in some electricity transmission infrastructure assets. Um, and we have good relationships with a number of these kind of houses. And we like to co-invest where we can get preferential terms in deals that are based upon solid assets with cash flows that fit squarely into that Venn diagram. We're not doing venture. We're not doing growth capital. We're not doing distressed credit situations. We are investing in, in, in blue chip private equity, private credit co-invests where there is strong asset backing. Um, and, and we'll talk about some of those when we look at the portfolio. Although it's worth pointing out that only 10% of our portfolio right now, a little more, 12%, is in these kind of private investments. We, we had a whole slew of exits during the last 18 months. And um, as a result, we're underweight private deals. Um, but we, we, we have one significant position, which accounts for 10% of our NAV in a solar business called Excelio. And this is a um, particularly competent team, Spanish-based, that have been building and operating solar assets for a long time, two decades at least, in Mexico, Japan, Spain, and typically in countries where the the, the need for government economic support is um, not there. So countries with high power prices and plenty of sunshine. Um, and they're, they're smart. They combine um, prudence. There's not too much leverage. They know how to get these things done. Competence with an ability to be entrepreneurial and move fast and get things sold when the opportunity presents itself. They sold their entire Spanish portfolio to China Three Gorges last year. and That resulted in a big distribution to us. And the leading shareholders in... Um, Excelio are KKR and Brookfield, which is the world's largest owner of renewable assets, a Canadian infrastructure group. So we're a pretty small co-investor in that deal. We pay no fees at all to KKR, and we try to be helpful to them in various ways. Um, and we're lucky enough that KKR keep coming back to us and, and inviting us to participate. Um, we also co-invested with KKR in a business called Calisen, which is the UK market leader in domestic energy smart metering. So Calisen runs today about 12 million meters in, in homes, the length and breadth of the UK. Um, more than half of those are smart meters and the rest are the old fashioned manually red type. And the KKR aim there was to internationalize the business, help Calisen target markets such as Australia, which it is successfully doing, as well as growing um, its business here in the UK. And um, the company was listed and then subsequently sold and we made a nice return. Um, there again, no fees were payable by us to KKR. So these are the kinds of deals we're doing: um, co-investments where there is a base of assets that are producing a decent yield, and where there is an upside story around uh, internationalization, uh, growth through sales, um, or, 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 or acquisition, um, and where KKR or some other firm like it are doing the heavy lifting. And the goal really is to have around a third of the portfolio over, in terms of a long-term average in these kind of private deals. At the moment, as I said, there's only one sizable one, um, but we are constantly looking at others. We, we recently participated in KKR's buyout of John Lang's infrastructure portfolio, which, which Luciana will talk about in a moment. Um, so at the moment, the mix is around 85% publicly traded investments, around 12% private and the rest cash. Um, so here's our NAV performance. Um, you can see that we didn't have a very happy time of it during the first nine months. Um, we, 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 um, yeah, we, we, we had a miserable first nine months um, and we've rethought the investment process. And with surprisingly low volatility, um, we have done pretty well. And um, this slide is just to illustrate that what we are doing works. Um, and um, we now have a pretty good five and six year track record. Um, the next slide um, shows the top 10 
positions in the portfolio. I'm going to come back to that. I just want to talk briefly about the discount and our ongoing plan. And then I'm going to come back to the portfolio and let Luciano talk through some of those positions and his thinking around those. Um, the discount has been pretty persistent. Um, it narrowed before the COVID crisis to mid to high teens, which would be closer to the average for investment trusts of our kind. Um, but as you can see, it's, um, well, it's irritating or attractive, depending whether you're a shareholder yet or not. Um, and um, some of the questions relate to this discount. And so we'll talk at more length around that at the end of the, during the Q&A. Um, but our thinking is um, to focus on in, uh, portfolio performance and also on marketing among potential buyers of the stock. And we believe that in due course, the market will recognize the value of what we do and the value of our portfolio. Um, so we shall see. Uh, obviously, the topic of buybacks is never far away from the table with the board. Um, but so far, we have decided not to do that in the interests of increasing rather than decreasing liquidity in the shares. Um, so um, I'm going to jump back to the portfolio. Um, we've talked about um, um, Excelio, which you see is our fourth largest position. It's now at 8%. That, that's denominator effect with the publicly traded positions increasing in value. And I mentioned John Lang, which is 3% of NAV. All of the others are publicly traded equities. And um, three of those in particular have become really sizable positions for us. So we're big believers in Alphabet. Um, and I might allow you to hear someone else's voice and let Luciano describe to you uh, why we love Alphabet. So uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, so you'll see that uh, the portfolio has one thing in common. If you look at Alphabet, Charter, Microsoft, Canadian Pacific, Saffron, um, they tend to have very oligopolistic um, market structures. And we believe that companies that have domin dominate, that dominate their sector uh, will, will provide higher margins and long-term better re returns. Um, in the case of Alphabet, it's very interesting because it's a company that is trading pretty much at the same um, rate, price earnings ratios of uh, the rest of the market, but with much higher um, growth. And um, we feel that is probably one of the best companies to own in the world. Um, the interesting thing, if you compare, for instance, Alphabet and Microsoft, effectively Alphabet is where Microsoft was a bit more than a decade ago. The, the, they, have, they hold like uh, huge amounts of uh, cash. Um, there's no, they don't pay dividends. Um, if you look Microsoft now, there's a bit of leverage. Um, they, they, they pay dividends. So you can see that the capital structure will probably eventually look very similar. Um, and we are very excited uh, with with Alphabet. We think that uh, there, if you look just at the core uh, search uh, business, you you get uh, uh, a price earnings of you know close to twenty times. Um, and you know you're excluding obviously the cash and uh, and Google Cloud. And we envisage uh, material uh, returns probably in the middle. Uh, double digits, so something like around 15% IRR in that case. For Charter, is is a very different uh, company. It's it's probably we could call Charter a public leverage buyout. Um, they follow the, the 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 current. Let's say they have a, a single digit revenue uh, growth. Um, and uh you know in terms of growth and double digit free cash flow growth and they keep that free cash flow levered uh which means that uh you know you you the share effectively over time the share just keeps going up we envisage clo returns close to 20 percent in the case of charter microsoft is um a much more uh low um, a lower risk uh you know it's a bit more expensive but you know it's effectively you know a monopoly in in, in itself um, and in terms of valuation is definitely a bit more expensive than alphabet but we are very very excited uh, in terms of you know all the growth prospects for microsoft and another thing that i will mention about the whole portfolio is because they all the the companies they 
they have a um, uh, you know they are they are effectively ol oligopolies um, they or monopolies in the case of Alphabet and others. Um, they have massive pricing power. So in the current environment where you have uh, the risk of inflation, you want to own exactly companies like those. Um, companies that can that have pricing power and can 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 pass the, the price increase to their customers. Um, I think the Cana the Canadian uh, Canadian National Canadian Pacific, the two railroad operators are very similar. So like we can talk about them together. Um, they, the, the interesting thing about the railroads is that uh, they own the infrastructure, they own the railroads. And for environmental reasons, I mean, it's very difficult to build new railroad in, in North America. Um, they, as they own the infrastructure, is the kind of real asset that you want to own in a potentially inflationary scenario. And uh, railroads are materially more efficient uh, in terms of resource efficiency um, than, than trucks. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, returns, we are thinking approximately around 10 to 12% for Canadian national Canadian Pacific long-term, um, which, you know, for the quality, for, for the quality of, um, uh, of, of that kind of business in, and in, a in a very, uh, protective, uh, sector for Safran. Uh, is I don't know if you're familiar with Safran is is the manufacturer engines uh, for aircraft. They are investing uh, massively in, in research for decarbonizing air travel. They the, their new uh, engines, the Leap One, uh, can already run on biodiesel. Uh, just to give an example, um, they make the majority of the returns by servicing the the aircraft and it, we exited airbus uh, a while ago because we felt a lot more comfortable with suffering in terms of returns um i think ben mentioned uh, john lang and exilio so i'm going to jump and go straight to ocean wilson ocean wilson is is um is a holding company that uh, has a majority stake in a brazilian uh, port operator and towage business. The interesting thing is that it trades at a discount of close to 40%. So effectively, we're getting Brazil exposure uh, almost for free. Um, this, this, they, they have two businesses. So they have this majority stake at uh, Wilson Sons, uh, which is the Brazilian port and towage operator. And uh, then they have a portfolio of investments of approximately 200 million um sorry 335 million dollars um and you can buy those two uh assets at a combined discount of 40 percent um we feel that uh that's excessive uh we see wilson sons uh even in if there's some political issues in brazil the majority of uh the exports that Brazil has are dollar based. Um, so we think that it's a very, it's a very solid business to own. And we are currently getting paid a dividend of north of 5%. Um, so I think Ben, this should be a good summary of the, of the portfolio. Yeah. So just sort of to conclude before we talk, um, um, in, in, in response to some of the questions we've received, um, the, the goal for us is performance above all else. We've got a bunch of our own money in the portfolio. What we're doing is working. We invest the money um, as if it is simply our own um, within the theme that we think is one of the most exciting in the world economy today. And, um, and, 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 and we want to compound our NAV over time. We're, we're not looking to share issue, share issuance, even if we could which we can't because of the discount, that's not um, high up our, our wish list. What we really want to do is compound over a long period of time and produce market busting risk adjusted returns. That, that's what we want because it's, it's, it's as much our money as, as anyone else's. Um, the discount is frustrating, um, uh, um, but, but, but um, we believe that the market will in due course recognize the value of what we're doing and the value of our portfolio. We think it's completely erroneous. We think it's a huge buying opportunity. 
That's why we've been buying personally and have ended up with more than a quarter of the vehicle in our own hands. Uh, we, we think it's a, it's a huge buy at this level. You're buying Microsoft and Google in the context of a portfolio that is compounded ahead of most others uh, for five or six years um, at around a 30% discount. So we, we think it's a no-brainer. Um, we've had a handful of IPO investors sell during the course of 2021, which has pr produced a dampening effect on the shares. Well, some of them quite big. One had 5 million shares, another one had 2.6 million shares. And so they've all got out. Um, and so, so the hope is now that, that um, a little bit of new buying activity as a result of things like this webinar that we're doing now, this is, this is new for us. Various marketing meetings that we're doing, we're meetings planned in Geneva and meetings up in the north in Manchester and Liverpool and so on. Um, we, we don't think it'll take much to narrow the discount now. We think it's an easy story to tell. Um, so um, in, in terms of, in terms of new, new issuance of shares, um, well, clearly that's not an option right now. In due course, we might look at a tap issue or something, but it's, it's not high up the agenda. Um, so, so, so with that, I wonder if we use questions to focus the rest of the conversation. Um, I think Paul, Paul is going to come on and explain how people do that now. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Luciana as well, thank you very much indeed for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab just situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just while team take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that recording the presentation along with a copy of the slides in the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, ben, Luciano, as you mentioned, we did have a, a couple of pre-submitted questions. Um, that we can run through if I may. The first one reads as follows, is MHN big enough to continue to interest the managers and founding shareholders? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is, um, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a big port of a portion of our own personal wealth and, um, we, we have a great time running it. We, 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 we enjoy working together. Uh, we enjoy the work that we do. Um, and um, we, we have very long-term plans. We, we, we're not in a rush to grow a massive investment management business through capital raising or anything else. We are, um, you know, we, we are interested in compounding our own capital and that of shareholders over a very long period of time, and we are really enjoying doing that, especially after the turbulence of the first year. You know, the first year, I, I, I was in a sort of, um, you know, a kind of apologetic crouch for about three years after that first year of negative performance. And so I feel very happy every morning waking up and um, knowing that we're making money for our investors and for ourselves and that it's working. So um, I don't know how you feel, Luciano, but I, I, we are happy with doing what we do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And sorry, before you chip in, I would just also say, if you look at RIT, I mean, RIT started with 35 million in the early 80s. You know, look at where Caledonia started and so on. You know, we're following um, you know, a similar kind of trajectory to many of these other vehicles that are now really quite sizable. Yeah, I, I will just add this a question about um, effectively saying that for a period uh, of time, it was difficult to get the proper quote for the shares, um, how do we can improve marketability and reduce the discount. I think one of the main points um, that, you know, in terms of size is, is this is like we, we need to continue compounding, we need to increase the size of the of the trust. I remember when I joined Manhattan, the bid offer of the shares was like 50, 55p, a 10% bid offer, which makes preclude some um, institutional investors from buying. Imagine you're buying, uh, you pay 55, and then next day you mark the shares at 50. So you're showing a 10% loss. Um, that's not uh, effective. That precludes a lot of uh, institutional investors or even normal investors from taking a position. So by right now, our bid offer is much lower. I think it, it, it goes between two to three percent so we think uh, the direction of travel is is the right one is focusing on performance and uh, and making sure that uh, we are fully aligned and and that investors uh, get uh, very good returns fantastic thank you both um the, the second pre-submitted question well there's two pre-submitted questions very much focus again on that discount we've talked about that a fair bit already and the viability of the trust going forward which you've touched on perhaps if there's anything further you could add there guys i mean what to say we we, we um we have a continuation vote every five years so i think you know if, if investors conclude that we're not performing and that the portfolio is is lagging in a, in a way that is unacceptable to them, then every five years they have the ability to come together and wind the trust up. Um, but um, we, we, we passed the last continuation vote with, with a huge majority. 
um, um, an overwhelming majority in the high 90s of percent. And I think we know many of our big shareholders really well, and especially given performance in the last five or six years, I think people are broadly happy. Um, so that those that don't have an, uh, a plan to sell the shares anytime soon typically look at the NAV more than they look at the share price. Um, that being said, narrowing the discount would be a pretty high priority this year. Um, um, uh, so certainly we're viable. Um, we, we have a team that is working well and, and, and the costs of that team are covered with the existing trust. And the net assets have increased from 60 odd million and more than doubled. Um, so, so we have 130 odd million of assets. Um, it's, it's, it's becoming a reasonable size. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Next question reads, um, what percentage of the portfolio do you envisage having in private investments and what are the benefits of the private equity exposure? So th there's a legal answer and then there's a kind of um, a, a kind of investment management answer. The, the, the legal answer is that we can go a little beyond half. Um, I think I think it's two thirds of the portfolio can be theoretically invested in private equity and private credit positions. Um, that being said, we would certainly never go above half. And I think it's unlikely we would go above a third. So the the um, the, 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 the aim, I mean, the, the target to which we are generally working is around a third of the portfolio, which means kind of three or four sizable private transactions. Um, I, I think the attraction of doing these kind of deals is the ability to receive market exposure, uh, sorry, to receive exposure to, to um, businesses operating within the theme that fit the investment characteristics that we want, but which are not marked to market um, and in deals which are led by some of the best investors um, in, in, in the field of private equity infrastructure and private credit who crunch out great returns year after year and have for decades. I think that's one of the attractions of Manhattan is our ability to access deals that others can't access. Um, however, one of the reasons why we aren't at 30% is because as an investment team, we see more compelling risk reward opportunities in publicly traded markets at the moment than in the private deals that we're seeing. I don't know if you, you want to add to that, Luciana. Yeah, usually traditionally you would be able to find some uh, public private arbitrage. Usually in private deals, you could see an extra yield uh, uh, but at the moment, we are seeing um, transactions that don't offer the same quality, like the, the, you know, the quality of the businesses that we own, like Alphabet, Microsoft, Charter, etc. Um, and at very low uh, IRRs. And the majority of those IRRs, for instance, we through Ben, we see a huge flow of deals in, the, in renewables. And the issue is that the majority of those returns are predicated on on high leverage and high leverage doesn't make, uh, uh, you know, getting to a 15% ARR through with a 95% or 85% uh, leverage doesn't doesn't make it a good deal. It makes it a very risky deal. So we're very happy with uh, with now that if the situation changes and we start seeing uh, good deals with uh, that offer very compelling risk return profiles, we would definitely reconsider. And we have a very liquid portfolio, so we can easily do that. Fantastic. Thank you, Luciano. Um, next um, question. I, sorry, Paul, I, there of is course. a question that directly links to that. Uh, I, I see a question which asks, how will we, how do we get cash out of these private deals? So, so the, the, in the normal course of events, um, we receive dividends. So we receive dividends from Excelio, for example. And we see, receive capital distributions when those businesses sell off uh, portfolios of assets, for example, again, as we saw within um, Excelio. And, and then we, we ultimately wait for the lead investor in those deals, whether it's KKR or Apollo or whoever, to, to, to negotiate a secondary exit of whatever, of whatever, of whatever kind. Um, and we had four exits in the space of nine months, all of them profitable during 2020 and 2021. Um, so at one stage, we had 40% of the portfolio in such deals. Um, so, so in the normal course of events, it's a combination of dividends and the sale of shares to a secondary buyer or possibly a listing. Um, in the event that we needed to sell one of those positions, there is a, a, a live um, and satisfactory secondary market for these kind of positions. These are not venture or growth capital positions. They're not investments in companies that are burning cash that no one wants to hold. Um, these are investments in assets which produce cash flow, which are easily quantifiable and there's a good vibrant market in those shares so so at kkr if it were a co-investment with kkr they would organize a secondary sale for us at or above nev 
Fantastic. I think you have covered off the next question we had here, Ben, but just in case. Um, can you elaborate more on the past private equity exits and whether your outlook for P returns match what you've managed in the past? Um, yeah, we, we've. Um, let me elaborate on what deals we've done. Um, we Our first was Excelio, which we've held for a while and which we still have in the portfolio, but we've taken around half our cost off the table. Um, the whole position is currently sitting at roughly a two times cash on cash return, partially realized. Um, we co-invested also, as I mentioned, with KKR in Calisen, which is the smart metering business. And again, we made roughly twice our money in a three-year period. And the exit was by um, a trade sale following a successful IPO into the FTSE 250. Um, we co-invested with Apollo in a real estate portfolio in Berlin, where the thesis was to upgrade the energy, uh, the energy efficiency of a bunch of residential buildings, so insulate them, put in uh, proper lighting, uh, refurbish them, and thereby move into a higher regulated rental bracket. Um, we were actually a little lucky because not long after the deal, a whole bunch of um, protests erupted within Berlin, um, uh, sort of left-wing calls for kind of caps on rental and so on. Um, and um, we were quite lucky that another group, much larger group called Adler, Adler Group came along and bought the portfolio from us and KKR, uh, Apollo, and we made um, a 25% return on investment in about nine months in that deal. Um, we co-invested in the development and operation of a bunch of electricity transmission infrastructure assets in Brazil uh, through uh, connections of Luciano's. We co-invested with Perfin Apollo, no relation of the New York Apollo. It's a very large Brazilian infrastructure group and made four times our money um, when we exited through an IPO uh, four years later in 2021. Um, th those are the sizable deals that we've done. Uh, we've also co-invested in the TCI credit uh, strategy. That's Sir Christopher Hone operates top performing hedge fund TCI, and he has a real estate strategy that um, provides uh, sec senior secured mortgage uh, loans to very large developers in prime locations um, who are building biz uh, buildings which are uh, gold plated or kind of best in class in terms of energy and resource efficiency and that's core to the strategy. Um, they, they've been unable to deploy the money as fast as we thought they would. So today it's about 3% of our NAV. Um, so th those are the private deals that we've done, which have accounted for around 40% of our portfolio at the, at, at the higher end. Um, and um, the IRRs have been in line with or slightly better than the IRRs we've been achieving in public markets, which are high teens. Fantastic, thank you. Next one, um, Luciana, I think you did touch on this throughout the presentation. Uh, it reads as follows, we're all concerned about future high inflation and interest rate rises. How well placed is MHN for this type of environment? That's that's our main concern. And I think uh, the portfolio is very resilient. Uh, we this this if inflation reaches something um, it hovers around five, six percent. Um, there's there's an argument by which uh, that would be good for for equities. Uh, above a certain level, if rates really uh, increase above that level, then um, well, then I think uh, obviously there would be a, a repricing in 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 all all markets. Uh, however, the quality of our portfolio um, and the pricing power that the companies that we own have, we feel very comfortable with that. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have got one here. It says your strategy focuses on resource efficiency. How has the last two years of increased awareness and focus on resource efficiency and climate change affected the portfolio? And how, if at all, have your views changed on the outlook for this strategy? I mean, I think the trend is accelerating very, very fast. I mean, it's hard to think of any business in any sector whatsoever that isn't supremely focused on 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 the way in which it, it uses natural resources um it, it, it's core to business survival now young people don't want to go and work for companies that are not taking the threat posed by climate and ecological breakdown seriously enough um uh, customers are turned away from businesses turned off businesses which don't have a good track record in this regard um the cost of capital is creeping higher for businesses operating in a way which is uh, deleterious to the natural environment. Um, we, we, this is absolutely mainstream now. And in, 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 in an era of social media, it's impossible to do bad things in one part of the world and think that you get away with it where you sell your products in a different part of the world. So, so any good investor is now mindful about 
uh, environmental, social and governance considerations. Um, there's now a, a, a very pronounced correlation between poor ESG performance and poor financial performance. It typically means that you're not running other parts of your business well if you're not uh, focused on, on ESG considerations. Um, so I, I think that um, I think that we're, we're moving into a world of environmentally responsible business and happily that coincides with good financial performance, not least because of the tangible benefits of using resources more efficiently. Resources cost money. Um, and if you can use them more efficiently, you save money. It's, it's, it's very logical. Um, so I, um, I, I've never been more optimistic about the theme um, and, for, for, and for the world, in a sense, not that that is our consideration as investors, um, but, but um, nevertheless. And, um, and um, the companies in which we are invested are absolutely market leading in lots of these areas. Google, for example, is of all the tech businesses, it's the one that uses the most power. And 100% of the power that it uses comes from renewable sources, which makes it, I think, the largest single buyer of renewable power in the world. Um, its data centers, which um, have proliferated across the world, are on average 25% more efficient than everyone else's data centers. Um, partly as a result of the deep mind artificial intelligence technology that it applies to them. Um, so, so and, and the examples go on. M M Microsoft is doing all sorts of extraordinary things in this space as well. So um, I think the story gets stronger and stronger. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, next one we have here is, as you say, the approach MHN um, is a family office in style. Um, what do you think are the most compelling reasons for buying MHN and how, do man how much does management have invested in MHN? Well, the most compelling reason has to be the discount. I mean, at this stage, being able to buy Microsoft, Google, Charter, a lot of these world leading blue chip companies, which we consider to be attractively valued today, but at a 30% discount. I mean, that's got to be the kind of no brainer. Um, you know, element of, of, of the case for buying shares in Manhattan. Um, I, I'd also say the alignment, the fact that we own 25% of the shares in the vehicle, um, that's a big chunk of our available liquid wealth, um, and we continue to buy more. Um, so there is an absolute alignment of interest here. Our, our single interest in, in respect of Manhattan is to produce the best possible risk-adjusted returns because it's our money. Um, and I'd say third, it's the track record. You know, what, what we do works. You know, Lu Luciano is an excellent risk manager. Um, I, I, I think I've got a reasonable nose for, for an opportunity in private markets in particular. Our investment committee is really well-rounded and the four of us have some excellent discussions and I think come up with good decisions and we don't get everything right, but we've produced nearly 16% annualized performance for six years with low volatility, investing in high quality companies. No, I, I think we're good. I think I think that, that would be the third reason for me is that I think we will continue to compound at this kind of rate. Um, and fourthly, and finally, I would say that an ability to access off-market, you know, world-class private equity infrastructure and private credit opportunities without paying fees to um, the, the the underlying managers, I think, is um, pretty unique. Uh, you, you you just can't get that um, as as a regular investor. Um, so I think we've put ourselves in quite a unique position in relation to five or six very, very smart investment firms. Um, and um, the long term average will be that, that that is around a third of our portfolio. That's great. Thank you, Ben. I think you've actually covered off the next question, which you, what, are, what were the advantages of the strategy very well there. So thank you indeed. Um, uh, next one we have here is, I think you really have covered this, but if there's anything to add, how did the portfolio fare during times of stress, during the pandemic, during lockdown, sell-offs? You just mentioned you're not uh, the correlation, low correlation you have, but if there's anything further to add. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll give the high level and Luciana might give a little bit more data, but we we, we, we've been very pleased with how the portfolio has held up in every single sell-off that we've experienced during the last 15, 16, sorry, during the last five or six years. Um, we, we, we typically outperform to a greater extent in down markets than we do in up markets. And during the initial COVID panic, when markets sold off sharply, we actually entered the crisis with a bunch of cash. Um, I think from memory, around 15% of the portfolio was in cash as we went into the crisis and we deployed that cash at near the bottom towards the end of April, early May, uh, when we felt that things had been oversold. So um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Luciano, around correlation. No, 
You know, it's just that uh, I think that uh, the issue with the discounts is that you have, um, um, they are very sticky, and especially depending on the size of the trust. I mean, we, uh, this, there's a few statistics that show that uh, close end investment trusts in the UK that trade below with 200 ma million pounds of market cap, they trade with an average discount of 15 to 20 percent. Um, I think that the discount was perhaps was made sense at the beginning when uh, after the, the bad performance. But now that we are um, performing, I think the, the discount is, is excessive. We managed to narrow the discount to 15 percent uh, at the beginning, uh, just at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Um, and I think uh, that will happen eventually. Uh, we just need to make sure that we continue focusing on returns. Fantastic. Thank you, Luciano. Um, we are sort of coming up towards the end of the session. We have got uh, a few more questions. If there are any there that we haven't covered off, if I could just ask you just to click on that Q&A tab, guys, and just um, where appropriate to do so, read out the question, give your response. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, I only see one. There's, there's a question here. Would you issue shares at a discount to an AV? And I think the answer is very quickly, it's very quick, no. We definitely are not going to do anything that is dilutive for, for investors. There was before also a, a question that mentioned uh, where did we mention, uh, where, I think it's, uh, I can't see it now, but it was asking where we got uh, the point about where two thirds of uh, world's population live in places where energy is cheap. That uh, point was from uh, Bloomberg New Energy, Energy Finance. Yeah, there's, 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 um, that's from Ian. Um, there's, a, there's a, there's some amazing stuff on Bloomberg New Energy Finance. I mean, I, I, I um, I won't be able to look up links now because I have to rush to another meeting. But Bloomberg New Energy Finance has a whole s s suite of data around um, the comparative cost of, of 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 different kinds of renewables, and and the long and the short is that no other form of power generation can compete with solar in most of the world in an open competitive tender. That's why the Mexican president is having to prop up fossil fuels with enormous amounts of subsidy. Um, that's why Trump, uh, supposedly at the other end of the political spectrum, uh, tried to do the same. Uh, the, the fossil fuel power and to a certain extent nuclear simply don't stand up in, in an open and fair economic contest with solar in most of the world. And we're not far off that point, even here in the Northern Hemisphere, where we don't get much sunshine. But but wind is nearly there. So um, in fact, offshore wind is now the cheapest form of power generation in the UK. All of this is very easily available with the right keywords in the search on, on Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And particularly in the articles, various articles written by Michael Liebright, its founder. He's sort of a top thinker on this stuff. Um, there's a question here, do we expect to increase exposure to Asia in the medium term? Um, we have the semiconductor manufacturers, um, uh, some of which have Asian, which some of which provide us with Asian exposure. Um, I, I'd say we're kind of geographically agnostic. Uh, we, we look through the lens of that Venn diagram we showed you, the thematic quality and value. And if the company is in Japan or if it's in Canada, it doesn't matter a great deal to us. So we, we, we aren't proactively looking for stuff in Asia. Um, perhaps we should. Um, there's also a question about the performance fee. Um, I think this links a little bit back to the question we were asked earlier around, does it interest us? You know, is it enough to keep us going from a kind of um, ambition and interest perspective? Um, undoubtedly, Luciano has taken a pay cut to come and do this job as CIO at Manhattan. Um, that being said, the performance fee provides a certain degree of interest. And it was there in the prospectus at the time of the IPO. I don't think it's particularly excessive. It's a 10% of performance above a, an annually compounding hard hurdle of five. So there, it, it enhances the alignment of interest. And for a small investment trust like ours, it gives the team something to strive for. So I think the performance fee is a good thing. And um, um, as, as simply as a shareholder, I would say it's a good thing uh, because it enhances the alignment. So, so there is currently no... Um, intention to to remove that or get rid of it. It only pays when we deliver significant outperformance. 
Ben, um, Luciana, I'm just conscious of time as we're coming up to the hour. And thank you for addressing so many questions that you've had through from uh, the attendees today. Of course, you will have the ability to review any further questions that are submitted and we'll publish responses where appropriate to do so. Ben, perhaps if all just uh, I redirect investors to give you some feedback, which I know is particularly important to you. If I could just ask you just for some closing comments, please. Yeah, just one more question from Ian. Um, I know Benny Pizer at the Global Warming Policy Foundation very well. Um, I, I think a lot of the arguments they put forward are very outdated. I mean, they, they, they for example, were the driving force behind David Cameron, um, quote, cutting the green crap in 2013. And some very compelling research has come out in the last year showing that that produced a whole bunch of additional costs for, for UK energy consumers. Insulating homes saves homeowners money in their gas bills. Um, it stands to reason and, 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 and failure to insulate people's homes has led, uh, led to a greater exposure to the vagaries of the global gas price than we might have otherwise suffered. But I, I know Benny really well. I see him quite often and I know Matt Ridley and I know um, 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 a, a lot of these guys and um, do debate with them pretty regularly. I chair the Conservative Environment Network, which is absolutely in the thick of uh, this debate around net zero and which elements of net zero are a good idea and which elements of net zero are too expensive or pie in the sky. Um, so um, I'd be more than happy to catch up with you separately on that stuff because it's my favorite topic to, to discuss and debate. Um, in terms of closing comments, um, I, th I think what we're doing is really good. You know, we, we, it's simple. When we have a concentrated portfolio, we're investing in stuff that's easy to understand. We're not doing anything too clever. We're not getting involved in distressed credit. We're not shorting stuff. We're not trading. We're not doing technology innovation and venture. We're, just invent, investing in, in high quality companies that are going to be around for the medium term at least, and that, whose cash flows we can understand. And we're producing great returns doing that. And we're enjoying ourselves running it. And we get along very well with most of our larger shareholders who we know. Um, and um, we'd like to know you all better. We'd like you to buy shares. We'd like to narrow that discount. So we plan on doing more of these webinars in the future. Fantastic. Ben, Luciano, thank you indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and it's greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Manhattan Resources Efficiency PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you. And good afternoon.